Thank you so much, Rachel, and thank you for that lovely introduction. Um, we are going to be running, we've got a space of about two hours today. Now we might not run for the full two hours, but we might, but just to let you know, I'm going to plan at 11 o'clock that we take a five minute comfort break, because I think two hours is a lot. Um, although I'm fully confident we will have plenty to discuss with this presentation. So I'm just going to start sharing my screen. Okay, so as Rachel was saying, what we're going to be talking about today is the Bill of Rights consultation that's been released by the Ad Hoc Committee on the Bill of Rights, the deadline for which is the 29th of January, but we are also more generally going to be discussing the concept of a Bill of Rights and what should be in a Bill of Rights, what we think about that. And I'm absolutely delighted that we're able to do a specific one for the women's sector today. So. This is our session plan for today. We're going to do welcome and introductions. We're going to do a bit of an icebreaker, which has been really interesting doing icebreakers via Zoom. We're going to talk about what a Bill of Rights actually is, and also then the context of the Northern Ireland Bill of Rights. And um, the Women's Regional Consortium members are going to talk a bit about their work and about why the Bill of Rights has been important to them. And then also we're going to spend the most of the session is going to be looking at the survey. Um, in terms of welcome and introductions, I wondered if anybody just wanted to unmute themselves and give a shout out as to their name and maybe why they want to come along to the session. Hi, I'm Deirdre from the Women's Resource Development Agency. So I'm the Training and Development Coordinator and um, a lot of my colleagues are heavily involved in this. So. Um, you know, I mean, I'm just here to be updated and I'd like to have my voice heard. Thank you so much, Deidre. Anybody else want to jump in? Hi, my name's Paula. I also work at the Women's Resource and Development Agency. I'm the Training and Development Outreach Worker. And again, yes, um, wouldn't have missed it. I want to be here. And as Deidre said, um, yes, a lot of our coll colleagues are very heavily involved. So here to uh, offer my support, whatever. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paul. Yeah, my name's Eileen Weir. Uh, I work for Shanko Women's Centre, coordinate Greater North Belfast Women's Network. Uh, I'm here just to find out the information and what has been put into it for women so I can take it back to the network uh, so we can also have a consultation on the document. Hi, my name is Helen Crickard from Reclaim the Agenda. And again, just want to find out um, what the current state of play is and uh, so that we can sp spread the word around to make sure that we do get something that is fit for purpose. Thank you so much, Helen. And for anyone who's just joining us, just if you feel happy and comfortable to do so, we're just dropping in, giving our names and kind of why we decided to come along today. Um, I'm Cathy Wolf. Oh, all right. Go on ahead, Anne. Okay, um, I'm Anne McVicker, WRDA, and um, I'm here out of curiosity because I didn't think that we have got the power to um, make the legislation here for Bill of Rights. So just want to see how all of that plays out. I'm Cathy Wolf. I run the Community Relations Forum based in Antrim and Newton Abbey. And I also run a, a women's group on a Monday night. Um, and also a wee bit like Anne. I'm just interested in getting more information. Pass on. Thank you both so much. Does anybody else want to jump in or will I hop on to her next? I'll maybe just zoom on then. Um, so the first thing we're going to do is a bit of an icebreaker. This has had varied success over Zoom, but um, we'll give it a go anyway. So Desert Island Society. The idea is that everybody on this Zoom call has been shipwrecked on a desert island. And we quickly realized that in order to survive, we're going to need to agree some ground rules for the good of everyone and for the survival of everyone. And I wanted to ask you folks, you can either drop it into the chat or just unmute yourself and shout out, what are some of the most important rules to make sure that everyone are protected? What are some of those ground rules that we're gonna to need to lay down? We have to work for the good of the group, the whole group.
sorry, I was on mute there. But yeah, no, this is great. So we've got sharing resources, respect for each other, working for the good of the whole group, the equal voices in decision making, listening to each other, that's another big one. The allocation of resources and space, recognition of privacy, equality, and decisions and planning. Folks, I'm not gonna lie, these are like straight out of the gates there. This is brilliant. Anybody else, anything? Or any, maybe like not so much rules, but concepts or ideas that we have to keep in mind in order to make everything work in a new society? It could be merit in all ideas. You know, sometimes somebody puts you down about an idea, but really if people worked at the idea, maybe it just needs tweaked. Whereas yeah. some people just throw it out rather than actually taking a wee look at it and saying, well, it doesn't have any merit. And actually considering what people are talking about. And then Rachel as well is coming in with identifying priorities for what needs done. So kind of things we're talking about, equality, we're talking about respect, we're talking about um, making sure that things are shared out and that everybody's getting what they need. And democracy, choosing a group of individuals to make decisions. So certainly laying down some ground rules for democracy. So the reason that we do this kind of icebreaker is because and this was no exception. When we talk about the rules that we need to build a society to kind of make things fair and make sure everybody's looked after, that kind of leads into what the basis of a Bill of Rights should be. I see I've got another wee message in the chat here, so I'll just try and pull that up. No one left behind. Yeah, exactly. So we're trying to, so when we talk about these kind of things in building a society, we're also talking about what should be what a Bill of Rights should be. Because a Bill of Rights is a text that lays down the rights that everybody in a society should be able to rely upon. It's based on human rights, which are fundamentally about ensuring that people can live lives of dignity. And for me, I was just reflecting on 2020 and the amount of work that we've been doing in terms of the pandemic around the Bill of Rights. And dignity is what it comes down to when we're talking about how we want people to live, what kind of society we build, I'm just finding increasingly, we're talking about trying to ensure everybody's living a life of dignity. But the Bill of Rights is also, it's a safety net. So we know that when things go wrong, or if we're unsure about what's happening in the world, we know we have this set of rules that we can always rely on. And I just think with things that are going on in Northern Ireland right now, including Brexit and including the pandemic and how we've coped with that and how different people have been affected by that. I think now more than ever, that idea of a safety net given a certainty as we move into the future is more important. I'm now going to try to use my tech skills to pull up a little minute and a half animation. So please forgive me if it takes me a wee second. Um, should be there. Be sure. Thank you all so much. And now I'm going to try and pull back up the presentation. So yeah, 
at that point then do we have any questions or is that all kind of we're going to be discussing through a bit more of this um as we go on but are there any questions does anybody have anything they want to jump in and say at that point um just to say that i don't think it mentioned um um cultural rights no it didn't um I mean, generally, the Human Rights Consortium, we've focused on socioeconomic, our, our big thing in terms of rights, but no, cultural rights are definitely a really important part of that pillar. And we will, the survey actually does ask about social, economic and cultural rights. So we will be going into that. But yeah, that's, I'm going to take note of that. Also, if you want to find that video, I will drop the link. We've got a new campaign called Make Our Future Fair around the Bill of Rights, and that video is from that. But just to move on, I'm going to do a really quick history of the Bill of Rights. OK, so in terms of the history of the Bill of Rights, then I am going to do a really quick one slide. And I know there's people in the room who academically know a huge amount about the Bill of Rights or also and or have a massive amount of lived experience. So this is just one slide um, and I'll try and make it quick because it can get a bit dense. But I usually start when I'm talking politically about the Bill of Rights in terms of Northern Ireland. Um, I usually start in 1964 with Sheila Murnahan of the Ulster Liberal Party, who I think are the precursors of the Alliance Party. And they proposed a human rights bill to the Storm of Parliament. But this is a point that I think is really important that throughout the following decades, other parties in Northern Ireland called for a Bill of Rights for Northern Ireland, including the UUP, the United Unionist Council, which was the UUP, DUP and others, the PUP, SDLP, yeah. Green Party, and okay. also People no. Before Profit and Sinn Féin. So just to kind of give you an idea that in terms of our political spectrum today, in terms of parties, I mean, all of these parties have been calling for a Bill of Rights for I various reasons. Whenever he was on the phone to me. Um, the dates there are not exclusive. You know, the UUP and DUP have called for it multiple times over the decades, although they've now kind of switched. And the reasons they've called, each party has called for a Bill of Rights has been varied, but it's always about protecting people. So provision was made in the Belfast Good Friday Agreement for the Bill of Rights. And that's not just because political parties supported this. We know this ourselves. It was because of a massive push by civil society in Northern Ireland. Since 1998, there have been multiple co consultations in that time, and all of them have failed to deliver a Bill of Rights. We still do not have our Bill of Rights for Northern Ireland. The New Decade New Approach, which was a year old a few days ago, provided for an ad hoc committee to re-examine the issue of a Bill of Rights I'm going to take a pause there and I'm going to pass over to some of my coordinators on this to chat a bit about their organisations and why they got involved with the Bill of Rights campaign and what a Bill of Rights means for their work. Thanks Helen, I'll jump in first then. Um, so I suppose from there's a lot of people from WRDA on the call but um, from our perspective we are very much advocates for a Bill of Rights because we see it as being something that could be truly transformational for the rights of women um, and I think crucially, we want a Bill of Rights that is uh, robust and fit for purpose. It can't just be something that's aspirational, because as we all know, um, without having a way of enforcing uh, different rights, very little is done with them and they're not actually um, as robust as they need to be. So in the last few years, um, I've only been at WRDF for about a year and a half now, but we uh, have been looking particularly at Brexit and the rights that are at risk for women and how leaving the EU means that many of these rights that were hard fought and currently exist don't have the necessary protections that they should do. Um, so we're involved in the Make Our Future Fair campaign um, and have been doing different lobbying on the issue and through the work of the Women's Policy Group we called for a Bill of Rights to be implemented through the Women's Manifesto um, for the general election in 2019 and also um, called again for a Bill of Rights to be implemented through our feminist recovery plan um, as it is a way that could protect many of the different rights that we've been calling for. Um, so I'll just give that as a bit of a, an intro from our perspective and hand it over to the other members and certainly welcome if anyone else from WRDA wants to come in on that. Sorry. 
Shall I jump in next? Um, <clears throat> I was given the rest of WRDA a chance to, <laughs> to talk there. Uh, my name is Louise Coyle. I'm the director of Northern Ireland Rural Women's Network. And I've been working with Nerwin from 2006 um, since Nerwin started. And working on the Bill of Rights was actually one of the first um, meetings that I went to um, as an employee in Nerwin because we were at that time they were they had different kind of working groups working on different aspects of what a bill of rights would look like and what we might want to see and um and you know it was it was an exciting thing to be a part of because um you know it it doesn't seem so very long since our peace agreement um, <laughs> and i suppose it start it was it felt like you were part of building something new and and I just will always be disappointed that that you know there was a huge amount of work a huge amount of money spent on supporting that work um I have to say we weren't getting paid any extra money for doing it <laughs> but you know these things do cost time they do cost money and they do cost people's energy and um and there was lots of women in those rooms um putting their time and their energy and their effort in it because it will be no surprise to any of you here that um, women in the north have not uh, really benefited in real terms um, from our peace agreements. Yes, um, there, there is much less uh, violence. However, the situation for women in terms of poverty, in terms of their um, quality of life has not improved in the ways that we would have expected it to at this stage. And I suppose that's a bit that makes it constantly relevant to Nerwin and our work. We work for rural women. Rural women are quite often disadvantaged in different ways um, than our urban sisters. Um, how we experience disadvantage sometimes looks a bit different and the solution that we need to fix it um, then needs to look a bit different. And, um, and having our voices heard is so important. And I would say in almost every single policy consultation response that we have done since 2006, since we started in Norman, um, has made some reference to the fact that if we had a Bill of Rights in Northern Ireland, it would go some way to addressing whatever the issue is for women. Um, whether it's in terms of um, their visibility and decision making spaces, whether it's in terms of addressing poverty, education, housing, all of those things um, touch on, on, on our rights as citizens. And as Rachel said, um, most of you I'm sure will have seen the amazing feminist recovery plan. And if you look at every single issue in that, of which there are many, you can see how far a Bill of Rights might go in terms of protection for women here. One of our biggest pieces of work in the last couple of years has been um, on Brexit and the potential impacts of Brexit on women. And, you know, we're most of the gains that women have made in terms of things like maternity leave, working time directives, all of those nice things have come from Europe. They haven't come from Westminster. They haven't come from Stormont. And um, I, I think we're we're in a precarious situation going forward. Um, I think a Bill of Rights for Northern Ireland would go some long way for comfort for, for women here. So I could talk about it all day because I feel very passionately about it. Um, and I also feel that it is no accident that it hasn't been delivered here, you know, that something that would improve lives for every single citizen here um, is being ignored as part of a Good Friday Agreement, which had which had majority support. You know, why has it not been delivered? And I think when you start to ask yourself that question, you know, you kind of get a bit more ambitious about what you want from, from our politicians. That's it. <laughs> Thank you so much, Louise. That was great. And um, Siobhan, do you want to jump in? Hello. Hello, everybody, and thanks very much for coming um, today. Uh, women's, I, I work for a Women's Support Network, at, which is part of the Women's Regional Consortium, and I'm a research um, officer there. So uh, Women's Support Network have been involved in discussions about the Bill of Rights um, from way back, like, like WRDA and Nerwin and many of you maybe that, that are on the call. But in, in 2006, the then minister established the Bill of Rights Forum um, to progress work on the Bill of Rights. And we had a representation on the uh, Social and Economic Rights Working Group as part of that. And it's interesting to note that um, 
as part of that uh, uh, work, which reported to you at the Bill of Rights Forum, um, if you look at what the ex expectations for women uh, from a Bill of Rights at that forum, at one of the first meetings of, the, of that forum way back in, in 2008, many of the issues are still the same. So we're talking about democratic rights for women, violence against women, rights to dignity and physical integrity, health issues, and social and economic rights, which is obviously um, a huge area. So all, all of this push for um, the Bill of Rights and what should be included in it, and, the, and in particular, the involvement of the women's sector has been pushing for many things which still stand today. Um, and, and so it's so important then that we're able to um, push uh, very much for, for, for all of those issues um, to be part to be part of the eventual Bill of Rights, which will hopefully come um, come forward from this consultation. So, um, it's in my work um, talking to to women about um, the issues that impact on them. Most of most of that work recently has has been around um, austerity and welfare reform and universal credit and and all of those sort of uh, poverty issues and how it impacts on on women's um, lives day to day. So there are many inequalities for women um, in terms of peace and their working lives and social security and healthcare and political life and discrimination and stereotypes and all of those sort of things. And all of that work that we do um, gathers that evidence and, and shows very much that, um, that women still experience um, inequalities. And um, a, a lot of women and particularly when you're talking to them in focus groups and things like that way back when we were able to do that and speak to people in a room um you know they they talked about the the ordinary things that impacted on their lives and maybe whenever you started to talk about things like bill of rights and and maybe some of the international standards that apply they felt like it it maybe didn't apply to them but it really does it's it's all about their human rights the things that allow them to live um, a life of dignity. So, um, in thinking about some of the things that have been said um, and talking to women recently, so we're, you know, we're getting feedback from them about having difficulties putting food on the table and feeding their kids because of, for example, universal credit five week wait, um, struggling to heat their homes or to, you know, afford electricity because maybe they have, um, they're struggling to live on, on what is paid out through the pitifully poor um, carers alliance. You know, they're struggling to get a job or an edu education because of care and responsibilities. Um, and they're struggling to make um, d uh, changes in their local communities because maybe of paramilitary involvement or whatever the issues might be. So all of those issues are about um, human rights and dignity. So it's all, all of these issues could be afforded protection under the Bill of Rights. And it's, um, it's about uh, trying to reflect all of those views um, of women as part of this consultation. It's so important then to get their voices um, back um, in terms of, how, of what it means to them as, as individuals and what it means to their families and communities. So unfortunately, um, women's rights ha have partly been uh, front and centre, as, as both Louise and Rachel uh, have alluded to in, in the political agreements over the last wee while. So um, it's it's really so important then that they're, that they're represented somewhere. Um, and without these specific protections, um, women will continue to be forgotten about and their needs will be ignored. Um, and that is really uh, not just to the detriment of the woman, um, and, across Northern Ireland, but also, you know, their children and future generations and their communities and families. So that, that's why um, we're so keen to be involved in this and have been involved in it um, from the very beginning and why it's also so important that you're all here um, and that you're, um, it's so important that we hear your voices and we need to hear what you think about uh, the issues that, that, affect, um, that affect you and how that can then be incorporated um, within this. Thanks, that's me. Thank you so much for that, Siobhan. Um, does anybody else want to jump in in terms of the work of the Women's Regional Consortium or will we move on? I'm going to take that on, uh, we'll move on. So in terms of like, Louise and Siobhan and Rachel have given a really great overview there of the fact that 
the Bill of Rights debate has been going on for now, it's been 23 years almost, it'll be 23 years in April since we were promised a Bill of Rights. Um, but the latest incarnation of the political process to, towards a Bill of Rights is this ad hoc committee on a Bill of Rights. In November 2020, they released a survey to gather people's views on human rights in Northern Ireland. The survey closes on the 29th of January 2021, and I should note that it's thanks to the Women's Policy Group for raising the short deadline that it was actually extended to the end of January. I've included a link there um, for where you can click to get to the survey. You fill it in online and you have to, you know, fill in on one page and then click to the next. But I will send these slides on and hopefully they can be disseminated to everybody so that you can get the material. Um, in terms of the questions, what I would like to do with them now is to go through each of the questions and talk a bit as a group about what we think they mean. Um, and then have a chat about what the consortium has decided to take a position, why the consortium has taken the position they have in each of the questions, and maybe as well then some of the um, other organisations like Louise and Siobhan and Rachel would like to jump in and talk about what position their organisation would be taking on them. So I'll jump in. So the first question is, to what extent do you agree that everyone in Northern Ireland today enjoys the same basic human rights? In thinking about what this question means, I wanted to know firstly, what are your thoughts about it? What are the thoughts of everyone in this group? And are there groups of people you can think of who don't get to participate in society in the same way? So if anybody wants to jump in, either just unmute your audio and chat or else just type it into the chat box. We've got one, let's pull up the chat box. So yeah, Helen's jumping in straight away with migrant workers do not get the same rights. Um, and that's becoming even more true as our migration system changes. I mean, the migration system you can argue has never been fair, but um, it's changing again to reflect Brexit. Anyone else? Just one that I was thinking of straight away was around how disabled people to not get the same rights. Um, so one of the examples when everyone's talking about marriage equality, um, it still doesn't exist for disabled people. So you lose a lot of your financial support if you live with a partner rather than, for example, a housemate. Um, so this is a huge issue for many disabled women. Um, even just one example, if so I have a friend who is a disabled woman and lives with a housemate currently wants to move her partner in who's also a carer and if she does that she will lose over six thousand pound a year um, in support because of the really strict uh, criteria for housing benefit or other forms of support for disabled people so it's just one example um, of how everyone doesn't enjoy the same basic human rights absolutely rachel and uh like anybody six thousand pounds is a massive amount of money that's actually I'm always surprised that I can still be shocked, but that is absolutely shocking. And again, there is the right to marry. In theory, we already have the right to marry and find a family, but um, see here, Yona is saying, rights are not applied in the same way to everyone. It's harder for people for low, lower income, disadvantaged backgrounds to exercise their rights. I mean, that's absolutely true. I don't know, Yona, if you wanna unmute and chat a bit more to that, but I know in terms of it's one thing to have rights and it's another thing to have to actually, if your rights are breached, to have to go to a court even, that's massive and not something that everybody could possibly contemplate doing. Women yeah. seeking abortion services. Sorry, Yuna. No, I was just, I mean, there, there's so many ways you could look at it. I'm just thinking as an example at the minute, you know, children from lower income households during school closures, you know, who can't access computers and, and things like that, you know, it's their right to education isn't being implemented in the same way. And there's very little they can do about that. Absolutely. And you know, I know as well, Louise and I have chatted at length about access to internet as well. I mean, it's, it's an income issue, but it's also a uh, you know, geographical issue across Northern Ireland, whether or not you can actually access the internet. 
Yeah, and it's anything else, you know, linking to employment, you know, the lower down you are on the ladder, the harder it is to challenge yeah. if you've been discriminated against or anything like that. And what people might view as a rights breach um, can be very different as well, I find. Um, so Anne's jumping in there with women seeking abortion services in Northern Ireland. And yep, Helen said digital inequality is huge and it's been more obvious in COVID times, but so much the government does is reliant on the information, not everyone able to access. Um, we actually did a series of COVID conversations. We did a crossover with the Women's Policy Group in December on these. And one of the big things was, you know, digital poverty and digital exclusion. Um, but for us, it, all these things were things that pre-existed the pandemic, but had been highlighted by it. So it got people thinking about it during the pandemic, but these inequalities were always there. <coughs> and then, sorry, I've lost my voice. And then Elaine's jumping in on Yuna's point, um, rights don't mean much without access to those rights. And again, like, as I was saying, not everybody's able to go to court in order to implement their rights. Like that can just be too far away from most people's lives. The right to healthcare specific to women, maternal mental health issues. We have the worst services in the UK and Ireland. And those in poverty, food poverty, heat poverty, clothes, housing, should have a right to basic needs. You, yeah, you should have a right to access to these things and how women are treated in the criminal justice system sentencing is harder on women and the opportunities and assistance when coming out of prison as they do not fully take account of their children and the amount of <coughs> also prison and yeah digital poverty again in rural areas so i think on question one <coughs> we can definitely say that you know, we believe that there are groups of people who do not participate in society in the same way. And yeah, we talked a bit there about how pandemic and lockdown has affected people differently. <coughs> so for question one, we selected, we strongly disagree. And we just quickly said that not everybody enjoys the same rights and there are various levels of access and enjoyment of rights within Northern Ireland. However, looking at the examples you folks are given will probably strengthen our answer on that. Does anybody else want to jump in um, from the Women's Regional Consortium in terms of how they might take that question? Um, just very quickly in terms of care, um, because obviously women are more likely to provide care, whether that's, um, you know, child care or caring for other family members, and also that the whole issue of um, what's viewed as women's work in the house and it's come, kind of come very much to the fore because of COVID. So all of that is, is a huge issue and because women provide um, disproportionately more levels of care, that's, um, you know, clearly an issue um, as well. Um, and things like the the very low level of, of help for carers in, in terms of carers allowance and, and rights in general is, um, is a huge issue. Yep, absolutely. And I think we were chatting yesterday just about the shocking reports of the amount of women who have lost their jobs during the recession. And often it's just because, because of caring, they have no other option. Does anybody, Rachel or Louise or Paula, want to jump in at all? Or we can move on to the next one. Just a quick point, Helen. So on all of the issues that we've been mentioning as well, something that seems to make um, it worse is the fact that in Northern Ireland, they don't even record the gendered impact uh, on how people access any of these human rights. They have no central data on even, for example, how many women have been made redundant. Redundancies have tripled in the last year and they're not recording whether it's men or women being made redundant. But we know from UK data that it is overwhelmingly women. Um, and then whenever it actually comes to measuring the impact, on our economic rights within Northern Ireland, they still say things like there's no gender pay gap or even um, you know, men are worse hit by recessions when we know this isn't true. Um, so it's really, really difficult without having these concrete rights and proper data uh, on how people are impacted. How are we supposed to advocate for people to have access to these basic rights when we don't even have a system of recording who doesn't? Yep, absolutely. And that's something I've been involved in a few of the UN 
monitor mechanisms and that's something that Northern Ireland repeatedly gets caught or hauled over the coals about is the lack of data because how can you know how the decisions you're making are affecting people if you don't have the data? Yeah, and Elaine's saying the number of people who have left their jobs because of COVID, it looks like a choice, but it's because they're in an impossible bind. Um, so they get stuck with a meaningless right, but no access to exercise it. Um, I just... Karen was jumping in there with linked care and opportunity training and education for women is another big I, one. Yeah, I just wanted to, to mention that nobody had mentioned just as those opportunities, you know, training, retraining, education. Still, we're still looking. I mean, how many years have we been talking about the barriers to women's training and education? So that's including the child care, transport, uh, digital age, all those things link in. Um, timing of courses, cost of courses. So, yeah. yeah, I suppose just on that, you know, that quite a lot of the mitigation against most of these things is provided by the community voluntary sector, it's not provided on a statutory level by government, um, which you would have to think, you know, if we if we really did have a proper challengeable rights based framework, um, our government would have to take a bit more responsibility and that it wouldn't be um, the likes of our sector that are that are carrying um, the mitigations or trying to put some buffers in place to support people. Yep, absolutely. Yep. And I do, I have been wondering myself um, whether one of the impacts of COVID, like I'm genuinely quite frightened about the number of women who seem to be being forced out of the workplace or education or training. And as Elaine said, it might look like a choice, but that's not the reality. You know, it's not a free choice. Um, does anybody else want to jump in or? Okay, I think I'm going to move on to the next question then. It's really hard when you're not sitting in a room with people to guess um, whether these are right or not. So, so yeah, we said we strongly disagree. Question two then. Um, this one was about protections and it was, in your view, do people in Northern Ireland need more protection for their human rights in relation to any of the following areas? But before I show you the big list of the areas that they um, gave, I wanted to first ask you folks in terms of from what we've been discussing so far in this what groups can you think of that might need x or you know who do need extra protection so again just jump in or type it in the chat box <clears throat> and can get in with women <laughs> sorry helen i just wanted to say um well obviously we're all women but also migrant uh, the migrant population um, because a lot of them don't speak English, um, especially the older members of families and that, they need more protection, obviously, for the human rights to get them explained to them and stuff. Um, also, their um, homeschooling is a big thing for the migrant workers who, who don't have the language to support homeschooling. Their children are the ones that speak English, not them. Um, how are they supposed to... to school homeschool their children when they don't understand it themselves um so that's a big group and also rural women who don't have the access to services that uh, urban areas uh, enjoy so that's just uh, two of them i can think of yeah but absolutely and you can see then as because and this is something the women's policy group talk about all the time that we don't live single issue lives so people don't tend to just be from one group and they tend to have multiple identities and um, so you can be a woman you can be a rural woman you can be a disabled woman you can be from an ethnic minority background and all these things will have different impacts on how you experience the world and you can see when you start adding these layers like for the example of homeschooling how the divide starts to deepen and um, other things people are jumping in with are um, carers, again, BAME women, transgender people, women, trans people, um, the waiting list for the gender identity clinic hasn't moved in about five years 
um, people with disabilities, rural women, migrant women, trans people, women, carers, many of these people are more than one category, Ilian says, yep, absolutely. Um, single moms caring for children, homeschooling, working from home, and migrant women, trans women, disabled women, poor women. So massive amount. Does anybody else want to jump in? I'm really hoping as well, just whoever gets the chat sent to them at the end. I don't know if it will be Megan or whoever from WRDA, but if I could get a copy of that, that would be fab. Obviously, I would never share your names, but just in terms of my work, it would be great. Um, lone parents affected so much by austerity welfare reform and now likely to be impacted by this pandemic. Yep. There needs to be a recognition of intersectionality in the Bill of Rights. I absolutely agree, Rachel. Um, so for question two, this is, a, and I'm sorry that A is somehow like in a title font, I just kind of lost the will to live with the PowerPoint when I was making it. So they have this massive list of different groups of people. Um, you know, you've got age, caring, criminal, so it is good to see caring record or recognized there. It's good to see gender recognized as well. Um, then of course there's the option none of the above and other we believe that more protections that for the consortium's point of view was that more protections are needed in almost all of these areas the only one we didn't tick was community background and the reason we didn't do that is because community background isn't something that we could find that was recognized in international law so you kind of have where is it now? Um, you have national identity at M, at L you have language, at N you have political or other opinion, which, and also at E there you have cultural background. All of these have a home in international law. So we just, we decided not to tick C because we just weren't sure where that was coming from. And we were a bit worried about legal uncertainty, but I mean, that's us coming from an organization based in human rights law. So that's just our opinion. But we also ticked others because there's a whole host of international human rights standards that the UK has signed up to. And so it should be incorporated into domestic law in a Bill of Rights. When we call for a strong and inclusive Bill of Rights, that's what we're calling for, for all these international legal instruments to be put into domestic law so that people can actually access them and people can actually hold government to account. These rights relate to things such as those for disabled people, women, children, stop and torture, protecting things like the right to vote and also to health. So I see I have something in the chat here. Um, is community background intended here is another way of saying national identity in a Northern Ireland kind of way. Elaine, I think it could very well be. I think just we were just a bit wary of it in case it had unintended consequences and we were of the opinion that things like cultural background national identity and political or other opinion covered it but others can take a different view absolutely i just wondered if so that's kind of the consortium how we responded to this and also why we did um does anybody else want to jump in in terms of ways that they might read it or wish to respond. I, I think it, it's connected to the issues with the survey in general where things aren't defined so it doesn't say what they mean uh, by this so even in the first question do people enjoy basic human rights well what do they mean by enjoy and what do they mean by basic human rights um, so it would have been useful to have much more uh, explanations on what they actually mean so that you're not taking something and and perhaps making it more complicated or having unintended consequences. Uh, but I personally would agree with the approach that the consortium has taken here. Um, I'm just wondering, see on point J, where it says family or civil status, what is to be understood by the term civil status? Megan, as Rachel just alluded to there, there are a lot of things that I personally would find quite unclear about this survey. We are at all stages just trying to make a best guess at what's going on or what they're trying to get at. Um, so I think family or civil status 
oh sorry I've just flicked forward would probably relate to you know things like marital status in terms of you know or whether you're in a civil partnership but I'm not 100% sure and if anybody else has better knowledge then please jump in I see Elaine also has a question about P do they mean the right to housing I think P actually is one of those I mean you could read housing to be part of that but I would think no and I would think it's more of one of those civil and political rights they're talking about you know those classic kind of first tranche of human rights about the right to have and own property and enjoy it so it's probably more of a kind of neo classical neoliberal concept of property Okay, so if everyone's happy enough, I'm probably going to do one more question and then take a break. There are only four questions in this survey, but four is a big, big one. So I'm going to move on, do that next question, and then we'll take a five minute break just so everyone can walk away from the screen for a bit. So this question is about values. Um, in your view, which of the following values, if any, would make appropriate foundations for rights in Northern Ireland? So as with the last question, before we look at the list they gave, I'm going to ask you, and maybe you know, thinking back to that desert island, what are some of the values you'd like to see to underpin a society? So again, just jump in through the chat or on mute. Um, we've got equality and equity. We should demand a minister for women. And an important one here, um, you know, not gender neutral. Yeah, it was actually when the minister for women bit that made me think, remind me again, that one of the biggest challenges we have, I thought if we floated the idea of a minister for women, the first thing they would say is, well, you know, we should really have a, a minister for gender, like a gender minister. <laughs> let's not have the women have anything. Let's let's just say that, you know, the problem is that women um, aren't being addressed. The problem is we just we just need to make sure everyone is equal, um, which is not the case. Gender neutrality has done us um, no favours at all. It's actively working against the progression of women. I don't think anyone in this group would under or disagree with that, um, Louise. Um, I also see here Helen saying that the caring role is being valued as it's the keystone. I mean, I hope if any lesson is learnt from the pandemic that we've been through, it's how care is an absolute cornerstone of our society. Um, and we've also got fairness and democracy and providing a safety net and also that we aren't an afterthought. <laughs> Yeah, I think the safety net as well comes back to dignity. Um, I think what has been really clear during the pandemic, and I'm sure all of you saw those um, awful uh, efforts at, at giving free school meal children in, in GB um, school lunches, I mean, is that the safety net shouldn't look punitive. It shouldn't look, you know, there, there needs to be dignity and safety and security. You know, what does safety look like? You know, uh, but more importantly, what does it feel like if you're in receipt of that? Does it feel like a safety net or does it feel like, you know, <laughs> you know, how does it feel to you? And, and, you know, I think through a lot of this pandemic, it has really shone a light on, on how punitive and, and how inadequate what we think is a safety net, which, which we are all paying for. We were all paying for those crappy lunches. Um, you know, what is being done in our name with our money and what does it look like and what does it feel like for the people who are in receipt of, of that safety net, which none of us ever know when we will need, you know, what would we like it to be for ourselves? I completely agree, Louise. And I think seeing how things have gone this week with the free school meals it just shows how much 
it has been normalized that we treat people from low income backgrounds with no dignity where um you know how this benefits grounder mentality over the past 10 years has impacted things where people are are more outraged at people from lower socioeconomic backgrounds having the freedom to buy what they need uh, and why are we not outraged at companies making profit off this at the same time and how has it been so normalized and you know people who are trying to survive on universal credit um, have had so much dignity taken away from them but how has that been normalized in our society and how do we challenge it Yeah, I mean, I was quite shocked yesterday at how little of the discussion around that was not focused on the government who procured profit making organisations to deliver something like this. You know, yes, there was fault lying maybe with the, the, the company, the companies who were delivering this, but they're profit making companies, they're doing what profit making companies do and trimming things down so they can make the maximum profit. Why are government, you know, using that kind of a procurement system to those kind of organisations um, to deliver something as fundamental as food for children? I think the fact that it was for children as well, you know, kind of shines a light on, on that, um, on our benefit system that, you know, children are being punished for, you know, what the government sees as the failure of parents to, to, to be able to, to support them. And and we're not really stepping in to provide the support. I mean, I wouldn't have called that support in any way. Yeah, absolutely. And this is like, for me, one of the really things I geek out about in terms of talking about the Bill of Rights is for me, it's about decision making and it's about holding people accountable for how decisions are made and why those decisions are made and what impacts those decisions have it's probably not the most exciting part about the idea of a bill of rights but for me i just think it has so much impact in terms of that accountability in terms of um in terms of the benefit system i mean um the the cuts that have been made over the last 10 years because of austerity and welfare reform had huge impacts on women and lone parents and you all know what all of the issues that have come out of that but it just shows how many years the government were prepared to let people live you know below what is needed to have uh, enough income to, to survive with any level of dignity and really it took the pandemic for them to provide an increase uh, to universal credit for example they didn't increase any of the other uh, benefits they didn't increase cares allowance or ESA or any of the rest. So it took a pandemic to increase the level of universal credit by £80 a month and they haven't committed to extending it beyond this March and actually they've been given numerous opportunities um, to do that and haven't taken it and there's still a push on to get to get that done. So they're letting people live with this fear and uncertainty um, about increasing the, the level of benefits and really it's only increased it to, to an amount that kind of copes with the increases in the cost of food uh, and all of those other increases that people have had to put up with because uh, their kids are at home now due to lockdown and all of the rest. So it just it just shows that the value that's put on um, on on people on the lowest incomes um, that it took a pandemic to get any kind of increase and that they're they basically haven't committed uh, to keeping that increase despite the fact that the outworkings of this pandemic are going to go on for for quite some time. Absolutely. And when we hear politicians talking about how we need to build back better, I mean, if all of this learning isn't part of that, then I don't understand what they mean. And it's certainly not for me. But I see Anne there is talking about in terms of dignity and um, access to abortion services and the lack of dignity there and also punishing women for seeking their legal rights or indeed as well seeking to send them to travel to another island in the midst of a pandemic um, poverty has been normalized food banks and workplaces it's shocking and accommodating sorry i'm skipping ahead i was saying accommodating poverty rather than tackling the real failure um, and respect for diversity inclusiveness address female specific health issues like maternal mental health endometriosis menstruation uh, menopause awareness treatment and services women are continuing to be punished for not adhering to the norms demanded by the patriarchy abortion single parenthood career choices and even the christmas bonus for people on the dl or dla and pip hasn't been increased since the 80s 
and so many issues for women and other marginalized people because the whole model is based on straight, able-bodied, cis, white men. Everything else is sellotaped on badly instead of built into the model. So yeah, that's fantastic. Thank you all so much. Um, we are going to take a break in a wee second, but just firstly to show you the values that the um, ad hoc committee suggested might want to be included in a Bill of Rights. So community, human dignity, fairness, freedom and democracy, justice, mutual respect, parity of esteem, respect for culture, identity, traditions and aspirations, and peace and reconciliation. We ticked all the boxes A through J and because we thought all of them sounded like they could be a good foundation for rights. But, and this is another thing I'm gonna talk about very quickly and then we'll take a break. In the other explanation box, we warned that there is a huge danger in explaining values with actual rights. And this is something Rachel alluded to earlier today. Values are not a replacement for fundamental rights. So having values in a Bill of Rights as a way of underpinning the rights is a good thing and a good exercise, but not at the expense of actual rights that we can rely upon and depend upon actual concrete rights. Yeah, just on that, Helen, um, G there, which is parity of esteem, value in all traditions equally. I mean, I look at that and I, I'd say there's nothing there that I would disagree with, but I don't know whether it's just from years of the, uh, well, for want of a better word, the trauma of listening to, to this kind of stuff for so long that actually, what you know, are our politicians actually capable of valuing all traditions equally? What does that actually look like? Because it seems to me like a lot of the time what they, it seems to be if, if, this, if this side got that, I need this. You know, that's what equality looks like. That's what valuing looks like. And, you know, those words in there actually just trigger me a little bit. I kind of think, that valuing all equally um, shouldn't be a triggering thing. <laughs> it should be an aspirational value. But I, I think the way things operate here, you know, I actually, I would change that language. I really would. I just think, you know, um, it needs to be framed a different way. <laughs> I don't know what it is, how it needs to be framed, but just looking at it and reading it like that I just think that they, they, they will always go to that lowest common denominator that if we have agreed that we value all traditions equally they'll say well you got four days of this I need four days of that you know you got you know half a million pound for that I need half a million pound for this you know that's that's the basics that they come down to here all the time yeah I mean it's that whole idea of a shared out rather than a shared future but um it's also I agree with everything you say but it's also um it's about all traditions not just two traditions here and that includes for me certainly that would need to include newer traditions coming into Northern Ireland people with their own traditions and people who are rejecting those that binary in Northern Ireland so when you say all traditions it's also about what that actually means. Helen can I just say I don't even think that G party of steam is required because it's covered in, in H, respect for culture, identity, traditions and aspirations, and also in C, fairness. So those two kind of cover that. I don't think it actually needs to be there, but it is there. Like, But let's say it's duplicating it. To me, it's covered already. And it's a duplication. Yeah, you can see there is certainly duplication. Um, at the extent of like the things that we've been talking about, you know, in the past few minutes about what else could be included in that idea and um, in these values but also um just to be aware that values don't replace actual rights that people can rely upon to change things in their lives because at the base of this that's what it's about it's about people actually being able to lead lives of dignity if everyone's happy enough should we take a five minute break so come back Okay, make it six minutes to come back at 10 past 11. If everyone's happy enough, um, I suggest just turn your camera and your microphone off. Okay.
enough. I will jump on to the next slide. And this is our final question. Um, but again, it's a big one. So question four is in several parts. Hold on, I've got a wee chat. Let's have a wee look. Rachel's got it sorted, excellent. Um, so how important, if at all, do you think a Bill of Rights is for Northern Ireland? Um, I think I'll skip through this one quickly because I think there's general agreement here that it would be very important. Um, it's just like a list of questions, which I think is actually possibly adopted from questions polling that we had done in the past. So it's not the exact same wording. Um, and to what extent, if at all, do you agree that a Bill of Rights for Northern Ireland should set out an aspirational vision based on guiding or foundational values? Um, if anybody's having trouble with question 4B and what it might mean, please just know that I have been looking at this for about six weeks now, and I'm still trying to figure out exactly what that question means. So, anybody else? The way that we have answered this question is the way that we aspirational is that a get out clause that was kind of one of our questions and um, someone dropped in the chat asking about whether aspirational is a get out clause i also personally hold the view that a question like that should not be appearing on a public consultation that's trying to get people to respond like the public to respond and i certainly don't think that it should appear when there's no guidance on how to answer these questions. I just think that the question is not particularly clear and is loaded with a lot of terminology that's quite dense. But we said strongly disagree and it was for the reason that, was it Caroline mentioned, um, that rights remain only aspirational. Um, <laughs> I don't think anybody's been following the work of the committee like I have, but a few months ago they had a presentation from a guy, Albie Sachs. Albie was um, a member of the ANC in South Africa um, prior to, you know, the overthrow of apartheid and he went on to become, I can't quite remember if he was a judge, I think it was in the, he was a judge certainly and uh, high up, but I think it was in the Constitutional Court. And in his presentation, he talked about the, one of the things he talked about was the importance of a preamble for a Bill of Rights. So kind of like the introduction to the Bill of Rights and about how that's where you put all these values and all the things that you aspire to be as a nation and what you mean to achieve. And that has some legal sway, but you know, it's not the concrete rights, the concrete rights come after that in the body of the text, but the value of this kind of preamble is to bring everyone together and to talk about the society you wish to see. So those values, I think that's maybe what they're getting at, but it's so unclear, this question, that we just said we strongly disagree because we were scared that the danger was that this question was saying that rights would only remain aspirational. So, you know, the government would like to provide this, the government wishes to, but, you know, with no way that people could actually hold the government to account for that. So I don't know if anyone wants to jump in on any thoughts on that question themselves. Just the same as you, Helen. To me, this does seem like quite a, a dangerous precedent to set because I know from meetings with different political parties and their views on a Bill of Rights, some feel that it should just be um, you know, a guide with no actual enforcement. Um, and to me, that that's just not good enough and not what a Bill of Rights should be. And I think um, it's very important that we say why it shouldn't be. Uh, because you don't want it to be something like the many agreements that have been written over the years that don't actually have any enforcement and they just sit there and nothing happens um, once they're signed they're just put on the shelf and we need to make sure that that isn't what happens with the Bill of Rights. Yeah that that would be the position in Nervin as well. Um, I'm all for aspirational visions but um, really do they deserve a full question on their own considering there's only four questions? Um, if you're only gonna ask four things, this shouldn't be one of them. Um, and I think the reason I feel strongly about it is exactly what Rachel said. I think we know that there, there is um, 
there, there's some political support for only really a vision and aspiration. And let's face it, the reason we are <laughs> all these many, many, many years on from um, a Bill of Rights being delivered is actually because some political parties don't support a Bill of Rights. Um, and my concern is that their concession to that because it should be delivered and it needs to be delivered and they have said in the new decade new approach amongst many 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 other things he said they would do um that they would do this that this is a kind of a cop-out to actually delivering a bill of rights as we would want to see it which is actionable um measurable something that will make a difference to people's lives and you know we we can't live on aspirational visions <laughs> and like saying that now there is the human rights consortium recently um released a paper that we had commissioned by academics mainly in queens although also um we had a scottish academic involved as well katie boyle but the idea of that paper was that yes you have full enforcement and you have aspirational and there's a whole range of ways in between and different mechanisms but to merely have aspirational values i mean the consortium is still for full implementation of the international law into domestic legislation and making it fully accountable but you know there are other ways to do it but aspirational values still sound difficult and as Elaine says aspirational tends to amount towards on a page rather than actual action and I see Clara saying the questions are too vague in general and there wasn't the opportunity to say what you wanted to say and also answer the question and if you add issues around female health care they won't be acknowledged as it's not answering the question honestly I'm not quite sure what the best approach is for this consultation we are going to engage with it as a consortium we're going to engage with it in good faith we do recognize and we have communicated to the committee that there are some serious shortcomings we believe and um, for them though I think they're saying that this might be the start of a conversation so perhaps the best thing is to just try and include everything that you think you would like to see so that they're seeing the amount of issues that people want to see covered by a bill of rights i'm not sure if that's the right advice very much all of this is the consortium kind of taking our best guess at it so in terms of the questions and if we move on question 4c is about civil and political rights um I again was quite concerned that there was no guide to go along with this um, consultation, no kind of explainer and also I personally thought that using terms such as civil and political rights was quite alienating and you know could be seen as a form of gatekeeping so that only if you understand what they're talking about that you're fit to answer which is not how it should be. The Bill of Rights is for everyone. Everyone should have a voice in it. So, but anyway, civil and political rights, they say here, include freedom from discrimination, the right to privacy, freedom of expression, assembly, religion, and movement, and the right to a fair trial. Then they ask, to what extent, if at all, do you agree that a Bill of Rights for Northern Ireland should include civil and political rights? We said we strongly agree. And when they go on to ask what, if any, political and civil rights you'd like to see in a Bill of Rights for Northern Ireland, we said the replication of the ECHR in the Bill of Rights and the incorporation of provisions of ICCPR and any other relevant standards of international law. What we mean by that is we currently have a lot of our human rights legislation, aside from European Union protections, a lot of our human rights legislation is protected by what's called the Human Rights Act. The Human Rights Act is a vehicle. So you have the European Convention on Human Rights that was drafted after the horrors of World War II and the Human Rights Act means that you can get those rights in the United Kingdom because it used to be that you had to travel all like you literally physically had to travel all the way to Europe to have your case heard if your rights were breached. Um, nowadays, if the domestic court, so if a court, if you reach the highest court in the United Kingdom and you still haven't had your um, right realized, you can still go to Europe as a court, the final court. But the idea is that you should be able to get your rights realized domestically and that's the Human Rights Act, it's the European Convention on Human Rights. The European Convention on Human Rights though 
it only really deals with civil and political rights. So a lot of the rights that we've already been talking about in terms of issues around poverty or housing or education aren't really included in the ECHR, so it is limited. But we would like to see those protections. Another big problem with the ECHR, or well, more with the Human Rights Act, is that the Human Rights Act doesn't have what we call a freestanding right to freedom of discrimination. And what I mean by that is if one if you're experiencing discrimination under the Human Rights Act, you also have to have another right being breached. So for example, the right to marry and find a family. If that's be, rights being breached and you're being discriminated against, you can use discrimination, but you can't just use discrimination on your own, on its own. So for me, that's a massive, massive gap. And then as well, we know, like for the past 10 years, the Conservative government's made it absolutely clear that it wishes to either scrap completely or strongly reform the Human Rights Act, which to me suggests that there will be an undermining of rights. So we would like to see these rights protected in our Northern Ireland Bill of Rights. The ICCPR, we've been talking a bit about the United Nations and these international laws. The ICCPR is just the United Nations covenant. So kind of like list of laws in terms of civil and political rights. So that's what we wanted. Those were the two main things that we thought should be included. That's really dense. I'm really sorry because the next couple of questions are gonna be quite dense, but I just wanted to hand over in terms of if anybody else has any comments. I'm oh, sorry, somebody. I was just going to, you know, say that I agree with you that if 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 the committee are putting this out to consultation, they should have had some kind of explainer or, um, you know, help for people, you know, to normalize this kind of technical language. We know that a lot of the rights law and human rights legislation and things comes with so many acronyms and heavy legal text that is very off-putting and very difficult to understand. Um, but actually, fundamentally, every single person does understand what it means to have civil and political freedom and rights. You know, we, we know that. Um, and I suppose it's about having a framework to try and articulate what, what we consider that to be with, without getting into the legalities of it. Um, and, and it worries me how serious they really are about this piece of work, you know, um, when they've done really no animation around it that, you know, I think most ordinary citizens have forgotten that a Bill of Rights is part of our Good Friday Agreement. I think most people don't really know what it means. I think a lot of people don't realise actually how at risk their rights are going forward as a result of Brexit, um, because everybody's busy talking about trucks and tariffs and where borders are and whatnot, and it's not being discussed. Um, and I suppose I just, I, I find this really frustrating that it's so important. I think it's so important. Um, and yet they've really done very little to support people to properly engage with this. I, I completely agree with everything Louise has just said there in terms of this consultation and how they value it. I know we're all very restricted because of COVID and, you know, what can be done. But at, at the very least, I think there should have been an attempt to um, to engage with people, to explain things out, to, you know, get to, to actively try and get groups of people together. I know we're doing it, but they, as a, as a committee, they should, you know, if they really want to hear what people think, then they need to um, explain it. Uh, right down to how it impacts on their lives and explain it simply and try and and, and really push to gather those opinions um, and that that has not happened it, it, once again it has been left to um, our sector to do it um, and so you know there, there has been no attempt to, to do any explanation or workshops or any of those things that that should, should come with proper engagement um, in this exercise and and, and I really think it, it's such an important issue, as Louise said, um, that needs properly explained to people. And then they will tell you everything that, that you want to hear about how it 
uh, what they think and how it impacts on their lives. They'll tell you it all whenever whenever it's made properly clear to them um, about, the, about the impacts. Yep, thank you so much. So I'm going to move on then to the next slide, which is parts C and or E and F. So again, Megan had talked about cultural rights at the start, so they do include um, socioeconomic and cultural rights. So again, I think this is a bit of gatekeeping. I don't think probably it's intentional, but I just think using language like this you know, has a chilling effect on people actually um, answering. And as Siobhan said, people have their answers. They know what to say and they know what they want to see. It's just sometimes phrasing it like this can make it feel like, you know, they're saying the wrong thing um, or they don't know what to say. And that's just not true. So there's an engagement issue there, but, you know, it's here. It's what we have. So socioeconomic rights and cultural rights are as they say here, rights around standards of living, health, social security, victims, education, language. And the question asked, to what extent, if at all, do you agree a Bill of Rights for Northern Ireland should include social, economic and cultural rights? Um, socioeconomic rights, as I always call them, or ESC rights, they're kind of seen as second generation rights. So, you know, <coughs> you had all rights like kind of to vote, rights around democracy and things like that, those civil and political rights, and then came in the socioeconomic rights. I think it's quite clear that a lot of, okay, Elaine thinks that it's not, the chilling effect is not necessarily accidental. Um, the, the kind of rights we've been talking about today, a lot of them I think would fall into this category. Um, they're sometimes seen by politicians as being less important. I personally, no, the, the international stand on it is that all rights are equally important. And I struggled to see how something like the right to vote can be more important than, you know, the right to health. I just, I personally struggled to see how that is. But in terms of whether they should be included, we said, absolutely. And for us as an organization, just because we are human rights organizations, the kind of things we said were incorporation of these international standards relating to socioeconomic rights and cultural rights, specifically ICESCO, that's the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, and also CERD, that's the um, Covenant on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, CEDAW is the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, CRC is the one on the rights of the child, and CRPD is the rights of people with disabilities. Um, those were the rights, the rights though that we've been talking about all day, the things people have been calling out, those are the rights that are contained in these covenants basically. So I wonder, does anyone else want to jump in there? I think it's just the same as before, Helen, really, you know, um, you know, especially if they're, you know, for the average person to be able to find the language to respond to that whenever that's how they have framed the question is really, I think, difficult. Um, you know, it can be very abstract, your social, economic and cultural rights. Um, what you do, you know, when you break it down into, you know, ordinary life, people do understand social, economic and cultural rights and which ones they feel they're missing. Um, it's just, it's very frustrating. Um, and I don't know what we do to support people better than this, you know, um, to try and respond to it. Because, you know, I um, have to say the Seneca me agrees with Elaine. I'm not sure that it's accidental. Um, you know, how much do they really want to get back or have they kind of already decided what they want to see? I, I mean, I don't know. Um, I, I just, you know, for the likes of us who are used to, you know, the language of CEDAW and things like that, you know, it's fine. And to be honest with you, I'm not sure even some of our politicians know what that stuff means. Um, never mind the average person you know yes they're important and yes we will respond to that but if you're looking for numbers of people to respond to this average citizens who whose job is not policy every day 
this is not this is not the way to garner people's views it almost feels yeah, like just, hitting, the, hitting the rights against rights you know which rights are most important and we know in northern ireland when that question's asked all of the all of the old history that we have all just turns up and it, it's just not helpful at all it's it's, it's very sad actually it's like whose rights are most important not that's which what, rights are more important yeah that's exactly what it will come down to when it's framed when it's framed like that you know i think i mean i completely agree with what louise and helen helen said there about this is really unhelpful for most people but for those of us who are used to dealing with it i think we need to point out as well that you know the northern ireland is bound by all of those international standards you know because the uk has ratified them so they so they can't uh, just say you know these are aspirational or something actually you know they are being held to account for how they're implementing that again you know i'm not sure that they don't already know and don't care but keeping no, pointing it out a... is useful yeah, that's a really important point. Like all these international standards I've been talking about today, the UK has signed up to them and they've agreed to be bound by them. And they have a responsibility to see them come into effect in their country and to abide by them in their country. And I'm not actually sure that all of our politicians are aware of that. Not sure the UK government are always aware either, Helen. Like, let's be fair. You know, I had a query from uh, from a member yesterday. He was trying to apply for an EHIC card, which has now changed to a global card if you're a UK citizen. But, you know, <laughs> to be honest with you, if, if you wanted an EHIC card, they were telling you you needed to renounce your Britishness, uh, your British citizenship, which goes back to the whole Emma D'Souza thing where the Home Office considers anyone born in Northern Ireland to be British, regardless of the Good Friday Agreement, which protects your right not to identify yourself as British if you're from Northern Ireland. So, you know, they're they're driving a coach on horses through international legislation that they are co-guarantors of. So, you know, we can't assume that they're going to uphold anything they've signed up to unless we hold them to account for it. And for me, that's now more than ever around the Bill of Rights is what I keep coming back to because there is so much uncertainty and I mean our Secretary of State for Northern Ireland um, outright admitted in Parliament that he would if we needed to we would breach international law in a what was it a specific and limited way as if that somehow made it okay um, in terms okay. of our, sorry Oh, sorry, just one thing I was going to say on this and um, why I'm so frustrated by this process is that, yes, it is up to the UK government to implement a Bill of Rights and this new ad hoc committee was set up through New Decade, New Approach. But to me, it just feels like a tick box exercise rather than actually engaging with the public, because um, when we challenged them about the length of time for this survey, um, they extended it to 12 weeks, which was the absolute bare minimum. Um, but took no responsibility for any other aspect of this survey. So they took no responsibility for this not actually being accessible for the language that they used and for how difficult it was for all of us to engage with women um, because we can't do the focus groups that we would normally do. Yet at the same time, they say, oh, well, we can't do these public outreach events because of COVID. So why does that apply to them, but not to us and still expect us to put in a response? Um, and it's just to me, you know, what's actually going to come out of this? Yes, we might be able to make a really strong case for a Bill of Rights in Northern Ireland and, and make that known. But if they actually cared about what people thought, this wouldn't be rushed through the way that it is. And one example I keep thinking of, um, and it's only because I was in an all party group yesterday on domestic violence. They were talking about how when they were putting through the domestic violence bill and MLAs were still there at like 11 o'clock at night and they were reading out statements from women who'd been impacted by domestic violence and how powerful that was, you know, when they actually engage with women and hear their voices, it makes such a big difference to legislation. Why are they not doing it on something as important as this, uh, particularly because of COVID and Brexit and all the risks that exist right now? So in answer on all of these questions, I think I'll probably be very frustrated in what I'm saying uh, and how this isn't good enough. And one thing I would say there, like for the Human Rights Consortium, this is something that we are going to engage with 
in good faith, as I keep saying, and we're going to keep engaging with the ad hoc committee, but we are in no way putting all our eggs in that basket. The Make Our Future Fair campaign that um, we launched on Human Rights Day in December is about so much more than just the ad hoc committee and engaging with the ad hoc committee. So there is much more going on than just this consultation and than just the ad hoc committee's work. Um, the, the, sorry, go oh, ahead. I just want to ask, um, looking at this consultation and it is basically a tick box for those that can even get through the language of it, okay? And as we said, bringing that to women on the ground or getting, you know, buy-in from the public. Nobody knows about it. There's no ad campaign. There's no nothing. OK, but also in terms of moving this forward, do you have any idea of what is there? I mean, they've up a forward work plan, but it's just more people presenting at the committee. I've gone back through all the, com the, the committee, the ad hoc committee minutes. There's nothing in there that apart from presentations that have been made, so is there is there a timeline? Is there further consultation? Is it, you know, look at the work that was done back in 2007, 2008, um, um, jointly with civil society, if you like, right, or civic society, but there's nothing apart from this consultation or what I would call it a tech questionnaire, basically. Is there anything and what will happen moving forward? Have you any ideas of the plans? Um, I've heard various things from various people. So I think there are plans in the spring to do some workshops as well. One thing that I have been encouraging all our members to do is to write to the committee. I mean, if I can share the ad hoc committee's page, you can find the contact details for the committee there and ask to give evidence because there has been a lot of chat about how they've heard from a lot of experts, experts in terms of like academics and things like that, but not the experts on the ground in Northern Ireland who've been doing this work for years upon years upon years in terms of rights gaps. So I would absolutely cont continue to encourage everybody to not just be limited by this consultation, but also to write to the committee if you have anything you would like to share with them in terms of reports or anything like that, but also to ask to give evidence to make sure that the committee are hearing from people. I'm, I'm, I'm bringing it up because if you go back, like Siobhan and I were looking back just over, I wasn't with WSN at the time either, either but just go back over all papers and when the whole Bill of Rights in 2001 was first following the Good Friday Agreement. There was an outline um, of what it would look like, and there was a chapter for women in it. And then when they started and put the forum together in 2005, 2006, they removed the chapter for women. So, you know, it's just showing that do we need to, and I see just in the forward work plan, you know, there's evidence from the Children's Law Centre Disability Forum um, for disability people's rights. So maybe as women, we need to be put in a stronger case now um, for the inclusion of this and how it's worked out on the ground as well. I mean, absolutely. I think um, as well, like somebody alluded to it at the start, like the Northern Ireland government don't actually have the power to um, implement a Bill of Rights as was provided for the Belfast Agreement because it would be provided for in Westminster legislation. That's not to say, and I mentioned that paper the consortium released that was written by all those academics about different models. There's fascinating and amazing work going on in jurisdictions as close as Scotland and Wales in terms of pushing rights forward to the very limits of devolved power in terms of bringing the Convention on the Rights of the Child into how government make their laws that they have to consider the rights of the child and they legally have to consider so and Scotland is also looking at moving forward on some of those social and economic rights so there's lots that could be done by the Northern Ireland Assembly so just because um like we'll continue agitating at a Westminster level but that's not to say that even if Westminster aren't willing to move that there isn't law Lots that could be done by the Northern Ireland Assembly. So for us, that's just not a good enough reason. The idea that it's to be in Westminster legislation, there is plenty that the Northern Ireland Assembly could be doing within our devolved powers. Um, so I'll just um, jump here to the final 
question, which for me was a bit of a left field one, which was to what extent, if at all, do you agree that a Bill of Rights for Northern Ireland should include the right to a healthy environment? Um, Helen's already said this is about environment washing and it's there to look good. Um, and yeah, a lot of like pollution levels from high traffic. Um, so it's not that we absolutely think there should be a right to a healthy environment. We're just not sure why this question was asked or how it was included, but there's a lot about this survey that we have questions about that I don't think we'll be getting answers to. But for that one, we said we strongly agree. And there's a lot of reasons why you would absolutely agree for a right to a healthy environment. Um, but just to move on, there is a box that says, do you have any other comments? And this is probably where I would encourage people to, you know, go with what they want. You know, just if anybody wants as well, um, I have a paper copy of the consultation, so I could send that um, to Megan and Rachel so it can be disseminated just so that because you have to, when you're filling in the survey, you have to click to the next page and you can't go back. So if it's useful for people, what I could do is send out that because I did ask for a paper copy like immediately because I was not clicking through it until I knew what was coming. So I could send that around so that people could have a look and you know, if you wanted to draft your responses first, I know that that's certainly what we did in the consortium, but so I can send that paper copy, that's fine. But just for this last que question, in terms of any other comments, we had two questions that we wanted to ask the group. And the first was, what would you like to see improve for women right now? And how could we have protected this as a right through the Bill of Rights? I just want to spend some time chatting about this because for us, this is massively useful in terms of hearing from you folks about your issues so that it can inform how we respond to this consultation. So I'm leaving it completely open in terms of both the chat and also just unmute, unmute your mic and jump in, please. I think really in, in the issue of, you know, access to health care, abortions, telemed, you know, have all that implemented and also in the respect of privacy, how do you see that all coming in? I mean, um, protecting the rights of people who are pro-abortion and, and then we have a lot of health care workers who are, do not like that at all. I think there need, really needs to be a lot of work on the ground as to people's prejudices and think, you know, how, how are we going to do that so that people know that they're safe when they go to consult about healthcare issues? Um, Thank you so much for that, Caroline. Yeah, and as well, I would say, like, in an, I was just off the back of another workshop, somebody had asked about conscientious objection. So I was just looking up some general comments from the committee. And like at the UN level, there's a lot of advice around that kind of thing. You know, it's sitting there if our politicians choose to use it. Anybody else want to jump in? I suppose childcare is one of the, the key things that we would like to see improved for women because that's one of the biggest barriers for women taking part in, in any activity, social, political, economic, um, childcare is the top one. Um, and and God, there's, there's so many, <laughs> there's so many. Um, we would obviously, as along with all of the rights, we would like to see that they take account of rural need. Um, I mean, all new policy is supposed to do that. I'm not too sure the, the understanding is there of what that actually looks like um, sometimes. So um, I guess it's about in the realization of these rights that things are accessible, affordable, and you know, resourced properly for rural women. And 
I'm sorry, I'm I'm got my video off because uh, I'm, I've got an unwell cat and it's not good here. But anyway, um, what I wanted to say was we should be pushing in this stage, I think, for uh, an intersectional approach, but making that that phrasing as understandable and as accessible as possible as well because i think people kind of intuitively understand it but they don't necessarily have the words to put it um the way that we're phrasing it now and uh care like helen mentioned child care but care in general and the valuing of care work including you know the stuff that isn't normally uh this normally done within the home you know looking after children raising children etc kind of has to be uh something that we emphasize in this last question because it's at the root of everything it's why women can't um participate fully in society but it's also why women's work that we actually do and get paid for like teaching and like nursing and so on doesn't get valued in the way that it ought to be because it's considered to be caring work and caring work isn't worth anything and yet it's the bedrock of absolutely everything so uh, because it doesn't bring in big money it's not valued and you know we have to kind of emphasize that circular relationship between the undervaluing of care work and the undervaluing of women um you know it isn't just an accident that care work isn't valued everybody knows it's important especially now with the pandemic but yet it's still undervalued because it's something women do um, so it all comes down to, like everything else, it comes down to an undervaluing of women and a kind of underlying misogyny. And yeah, I'm going to stop here because I could go on for a week. I just want to jump in to say I've shared that website for our Make Our Future Fair campaign and also the site where you'll find the ad hoc committee, including their details are at the bottom left, their contact details, and also the link to the surveys at the bottom right. I've also included the kind of our draft of the paper copy with our like filler questions and also a slightly simpler template, although this is so dense that there's nothing really simple about it. But yeah, absolutely, Elaine. And in terms of care, I think we all know that one of the reasons is that women are just going to continue doing it and making it work. And that's one of the reasons that government don't need to pay attention to it. And it's, it's just not good enough. Anybody else want to jump in? We should all go on strike. We should have a massive strike. <laughs> I mean, it, when we look even at, at what happened with COVID and all of the emergency responses, uh, women were always sidelined in, in all of that, yet women were the ones who were actually delivering on the ground. And the last people that looked at was care workers in terms of giving them PPE, people, women who were going in and out of different houses. And there's so many women who are doing care work who aren't even claiming carers alliance because they just see it as, as what they're doing. So we need a wake up call for women here as well to start really um, valuing what they're doing, you know? Um, but I mean, in, in, in representation in, in, in any public bodies or any decision-making bodies, we're always in at the end. It's, it's absolutely, totally frustrating. Talking care, apologies, my toddler's just woken up, so if you hear any screaming. <laughs> um, does anybody then, are there any questions? I'm, I'm very much aware that it's 10 to and the Women's Policy Group are meeting at 12.30. So does anybody have any further questions? I'm also going to, um, my email is in that um, slideshow. So if you have any questions or anything I can help you with in terms of filling in the survey, please, please, please get in touch with me and let me know. Could I just mention just about the right to health care, but specifically women's health care, and that's in relation to maternal mental health. Um, services here, which was the worst in all of the UK and Ireland. Um, so acknowledging that and of specifically women's issues, but also other issues um, such as endometriosis, um, menopause, menstruation, that really aren't acknowledged. Um, and we're, we're nearly just supposed to just not talk about you know, issues that are specific to women. So greater acknowledgement, visibility, treatment, in that specific area. This is one of the things I was given a presentation, I think it was to Sinn Féin a couple of years ago, and we were breaking down really for them what rights meant. And one of the things I was using to talk about the right to health was 
um, it was actually, I was using um, maternity mortality rates and the difference in ethnicities in terms of those rates. Because when you're breaking down what rights mean, it's looking at how decisions are made about what research is being done. And also, you know, for me, it's about looking at where that money for research is going. So, for example, we know that things that affect men are better funded. And we know that the normal human person is, as somebody else mentioned there, in terms of what rights are men work for, is a white, able-bodied male, you know. It's, for me, that really exciting part about the Bill of Rights is how those decisions are being made and being able to challenge that in terms of what we know is a much more diverse experience of life. I would agree. Even if you look at the start of the pandemic, when they had all of the PPE shortages, um, the, for women who were working in hospitals, a lot of them were being taken off the wards that they were on because the PPE didn't fit them. Um, so a lot of the uh, different forms of protection was too big because it was based off the universal body and the universal body is a man's body. And it just shows you how much it's impacting every single thing in our lives. So one thing just for this, I would say, we're gonna be sending this video out. Uh, we're gonna upload it onto our website and there'll be an option to send through anything that you think should be included. Um, as well as, you know, a link to the survey and being able to fill it out yourself. But everything we've talked about today, I think we could put in a really, really strong response to this and use it beyond just this survey as well. Folks, are we happy enough then to wrap it up? I just want to say thank you so much. I have really enjoyed this workshop. Um, it's been great talking to all of you. And there's so much so much value for me in hearing the things that you folks are talking about and not only seeing that it does reflect a lot of what i'm thinking but also that i'm learning so much more all the time so thank you so much and thank you to wrda for facilitating the women's support network northern Ireland rural women's network and yeah mostly to all you participants thank you so much and i will send through the resources to megan and rachel because i think they'll be sending out a follow-up so Thank you so much and that's it for me if anybody wants to join in or jump in and say thanks very much helen that was really interesting and helpful and look forward to receiving all the information to help me fill it all in thank you okay folks you're so very welcome and i think we'll end it there okay thank you and i'll see some of you in about half an hour <laughs>